All right, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, you were listening to the Ode to Joy, or the uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Fourth Movement, lyrics by Friedrich Schiller, which a lot of people don't realize the original lyrics were written long before even Beethoven um, uh, composed uh, the Ninth Symphony. I'll try to wrap around back to Beethoven's piece here in a moment. Before we get started, I know there was an announcement yesterday about our CREATE conference. Uh, this is coming up in the fall. There's a number of us on faculty here in the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences that are going to be presenting at the CREATE conference. So if you have students who are interested uh, in art, aspiring artists, especially related to film, uh, cinematography, um, photography, uh, the creative writing, as well as uh, the visual arts, um, I'll be keynoting, and then there's going to be a number, again, of uh, our faculty and friends of the university who are going to be presenting on this. Please take one, uh, or take several, uh, back to your school. All right, you can see the title here. Uh, my background is as an historian, although uh, you're going to see here that I'm interested in many, many, many things. Uh, Todd's opening address kind of resonated with this idea of pulling all things back together, and especially under the guidance of who uh, Jesus Christ is. So you'll see some of that uh, throughout this. First of all, you went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art last night. Yeah, I love the collection. My wife and I and our family have been uh, members for many, many, many years, although it's lapsed. And I'm in my uh, doctoral dissertation phase, so you can understand we did not renew our membership. We have not had the time to go down there as frequently as we like. Uh, but uh, when you were there, I'm not sure if you got to see some of the exhibits that you're going to maybe see some up here. But the Philadelphia Museum of Art, especially if you live in this area, although if you don't, you could probably do this also online, you can actually use some of their workshops for teachers. And they, this is actually from their website. It, art ignites curiosity, fosters critical thinking skills, and presents challenging, interdisciplinary, and engaging learning environments. I'm not sure if this one, I don't believe this one is there in the, in the uh, Deschamps, in the um, uh, Dada exhibit. This is also a Dada work of art. It's Deschamps' version of the Mona Lisa. And actually, the L-H-O-O-Q is a kind of crude statement uh, in French that uh, Dada, or, uh, Deschamps put on uh, the Mona Lisa. But this one is sometimes there. I'm not sure if it was there. You got, OK, I wasn't sure. I actually was talking to my wife. I said, I don't know if they'll go down to the Deschamps exhibit. You know, maybe they'll be more inclined to go to Baroque, go to medieval, go to some neoclassical. But this is there. And when I take my students to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which my wife and I run a lot of tours there and have run a lot of tours over the years, students usually walk in and it's like one of those things, like, or they just dismiss it or they go, oh, you know, e gats, you know, I can't believe that's there. And they just kind of walk away. I want to come back to this and explain why this matters. So art matters. Now you may look at this and say, is that art? Well, certainly that's a great question. It's a question that we've wrestled with here at Karen in a number of our different classes. So I'll come back to that. Leo Tolstoy said this about art. Art is not a pleasure, a solace, or an amusement. Art is a great matter. In The Power of Art, Simon Shama, who, if you are interested in exploring art in a little bit more detail, I recommend you can find his documentaries. He's got an hour-long documentary for a number of artists, from Caravaggio all the way to uh, Mark Rothko. But he says this in his book, uh, The Power of Art. The greatest paintings grab you in a headlock. I don't know if any of them did that last night. As you're walking through the exhibit, you got grabbed in a headlock, roughed up your composure, and then proceed to rearrange your sense of reality. He says it's the power of art that is unsettling surprise. And when uh, Andy Crouch was speaking at lunch yesterday, this kind of resonated with me. I didn't have this in here initially. I was like, oh, when he talked about the end of Mark, how it leaves you unsettled. When he talked about the end of Genesis with Joseph, you know, as uh, you know, the people of Israel are going to be enslaved because of Joseph's decision as a leader, which I had never, I've read through that many times. I remember thinking, oh, oh my, that's unsettling. You know, I have Joseph, an amazing Technicolor dream coat kind of imagery in my head, and that certainly is not at the end of the, you know, the, the climactic songs at the end. So this idea of unsettling, and again, sometimes when we go through an art museum, we, we try to see it all. And I think that also resonated with what Andy was saying yesterday. Sometimes we walk by, we take the tour, go, that's pretty, that's pretty, I don't like that. Like, oh, let's stop and look at like, Van Gogh's you know, sunflowers. As opposed to stopping and looking, you guys did last night. Yeah. <laughs> and they are worth looking at, not, not, not to take that away from Van Gogh. But Who Needs Classical Music has a great line in here in this book that illustrates this idea of integration. We need not so much education about art. And I think about that about integration. We don't need education about integration. What we need is education in integration. 
which is a vastly different paradigm. I didn't understand this when I was an undergrad. I came here and again, some, some people, I, I heard this story all the way in Korea a couple of uh, uh, weeks ago, but I'll, I'll shorten it. When you went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, as if you were going down to the Deschamps exhibit, you came to a circular, actually it's where the Van Gogh sunflowers are. There used to be a fountain there. And the first time I really paid attention to this was I took my wife, who is back there, this is my wife Heather back there. <laughs> I took my wife. <laughs> 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 I, I took my wife to the Philadelphia Museum of Art because her previous boyfriend did not. I was trying to win her. I knew nothing about art. Um, I went to, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art for, for extra credit in my Lit and Arts class. And I took her to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. We went, and we went on a Sunday where it was free up to 1 o'clock, too. So that was even an inexpensive date as well. Um, so we went in, and I took her to the armor section, which I don't know if you got a chance to walk through that. I was a medieval historian, I understood that stuff, so I, I basically spent all my knowledge in about 20 minutes. I was like, now what? So we went to the, um, the Impressionist Gallery, and she's like, I didn't know they had that Van Gogh here. I was like, how do you know that's Van Gogh? I, I, it shows my naivete. I didn't understand it. And she goes, and that's the Cezanne. I was like, how do you do that? And she went around the room, in that circular room with the fountain, which is no longer there, which when we found out, we were like, that's our, our legacy as a, as a, as a couple. Um, how do you know that? Teach me. I wanted education, and it was the first time where I understood, or began to understand, I would say. I wanted an education in art, not about art. And you can see when you're listening to even the Ninth Symphony, this idea of integration um, of music, poetry, you're going to see it throughout this. Paintings, sculptures, architecture. Um, this idea of uh, journeying down this road. I would never go back to my 22-year-old self uh, in terms of my understanding of art at that time. He continues though, and I love this last line, I think it resonates with the whole theme of the conference, and I had this up a week ago, not knowing, again, what some of the other speakers would say. We need to be patient and humble. I thought that was one of the themes that even Jonathan spoke about yesterday uh, in the general session, the idea of humility. One of the things I had to do is I had to admit that I knew nothing about art. I knew very little about music. I knew nothing or very little about poetry. I thought poetry, you know, do you really need to go on for five pages on a Skylark song? Can't you say Skylark song is pretty? Done. <laughs> do I really need five pages of Percy Bysshe Shelley's, you know, hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never word from heaven or near it, pour as thy full heart and profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Okay, the bird sings. But I didn't understand. And interestingly, that's, that poem, I found not just resonates with the Romantic age, it resonates with who God is, and, and again, this I think touched on what Jonathan was speaking about. It, we could look at it as Christians and say, yes, yeah, Shelley's a humanist, but I can find worship through the lyrics to a song of a bird, and after having children, and if you have any children, you know sometimes they hear things that you never hear. And I've taken my kids on many, many hikes, and sometimes they've heard things, seen things, smelled things, that I've had to stop and go, wow, and it's made me see the world in a very, very different way. So how does this link back to, and again, I thought it was neat, someone asked yesterday in the uh, general session, uh, why do we keep going back to Genesis? You know, uh, Andy talked about Genesis, and Jonathan talked about Genesis. And even, again, this was already in mind about creation. And it is good. In Cornelius Plantinga's book, uh, Engaging God's World, he writes, God created the heavens and the earth out of his own goodness, power, and love, out of his enthusiasm for being. And sometimes I think I, it took me a while to read that into the Genesis account, his enthusiasm for being. Uh, El Greco said it this way, Hail the twinkling stars, for they are God's careless splatters. In Engaging God's World, which is a book that if you haven't read, I would highly recommend. We used to have our students in Students Life and Calling. We have some old Students Life and Calling uh, professors in the room. I wish we sometimes could bring it back, and it's worth reading. I encourage my students. I usually bring a couple copies with me whenever we hit the opening chapter. Go, read the whole book. Read the whole book. And Jonathan talked about the creation, fall, redemption, worldview, or, or superstructure. And this book is a nice, uh, I almost raised my hand yesterday. He said, Jonathan, what I would recommend is the uh, Engaging God's World book by Cornelius Plantinga. So if some of you are struggling through what Jonathan was talking about in terms of that superstructure, I do recommend the book. But he says in the opening chapters in the idea of creation, let us create humankind in our image. It implies a range of human abilities. So it is natural that the creation that bears his image would also create. 
And I, t I challenge my students even going back to that to say, even, have you ever crossed a bridge, been on a canal, been on a ship, been in a plane, driven a car, walked through a building and just worship God? Like to see a bridge, like, you mean use a bridge as worship? I'm like, yeah, as a reflection of who our creator is. Yeah, our things that we create are imperfect. They are fallible. They are fallen. They're going to be, they're going to eventually rot if we don't keep them up. But there's a level of, of reflection of who uh, God is. Michelangelo said, the true work of art is but a shadow of the divine perfection. So why create? Leonard Bernstein said, music can name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, said it this way, art is really people asking the internal question. What is it all about? Uh, I, I, not to uh, give you too much information about what uh, Dr. McCall is going to be talking about later, but enduring questions that play a role in the development of lessons and revolving around this idea. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe said it this way, and I'm not an artist. Uh, I, maybe my art is putting together PowerPoint slides. I don't know. Lego is a medium I'm very good at. I am not an artist, but I am, I'm an artist wannabe. I aspire to be an artist. I aspire to want to like hear the world the way a musician does. Joseph Caminiti, who was a good friend of mine, who was our symphony director for years, and I would sometimes just listen to him describe music in a way that I can't hear. Or an artist, some of our students who are artists and some of the things they've created. Um, and again, I can see some people who are artists in this room going, yeah, you're speaking, that's, that's, that's my language. George O'Keefe said, if I found I could say things with color and shapes, I couldn't say any other way. Things I had no words for. Conrad Feller said, without art, the view of the world would be incomplete. I think we can fill in that with a lot of disciplines, without history, without socio sociology, without music, without science, without engineering. Now I'm going to quote myself. I always wanted to be quoted. So since no one quotes me, I'm going to quote myself. Without art, the view of history would be incomplete. Um, I remember I had students, especially as a high school teacher, and it occasionally happens around here, although there's an art ethos at CARE now. Uh, when I first came back, there wasn't as much of an art ethos, and students would ask, why are we doing art in Foundations of Ed? Uh, or something like that. Um, now the ethos is kind of like, in, it, you know, it, it's part of the air we breathe around here. But as a high school teacher, I remember the first time I started using music in my classroom, like, this is a music class? You know, high school, it was great, because by the, you know, usually end of the first semester, like, so Prokofiev is my favorite composer. I was like, yes, I got him. Um, the same thing with, with the arts. Uh, I've had so many students go, well, I thought this was AP European history. Why are we learning about architecture and, and, and um, the, you know, sculpture and whatnot? Or even this, this is a, a memorial uh, to the Holocaust. Without art, this story would also be incomplete. Because sometimes we don't even see the Holocaust through these lenses. These are anonymous paintings. Uh, I, a couple years ago, uh, Gary Schnicker, who's in the School of Divinity, uh, Joseph Caminiti, the symphony director, and myself, uh, delivered an address in chapel. And it was about tragedy in the arts. And Gary spoke on the Chronicles. Um, I spoke on poetry and the visual arts through the Holocaust. And Joseph spoke on, and we listened to Schoenberg's Opus 44, which is about the liquidation of the um, Krakow ghetto. And it's, if you've never worked at it's Opus 44 by Schoenberg. And it's a powerful, autonal piece. Uh, and it's in English uh, with like a heavy Ger German accent, which I think makes it even uh, more powerful. But this p particular painting right here, that's a child's drawing. I don't understand what it's like to be in this circumstance and still need to do art and still have to write poetry. I found a poem that was exhumed from a body that was, uh, the person died two days after they wrote, at least they think, um, in terms of the, ex um, the exhuming of the body, uh, in a mass grave in the Balkan Peninsula. He felt the need, starving, being marched, forced marched, to still write a poem. I, again, that, that perplexes me. And, but it makes me read the Psalms vastly different. When David is being chased by Saul, I mean, the Psalms just open up. It, it, the idea of that he needed to write poetry. He didn't write a story, he didn't write a journal, he wrote a poem. Art is what makes us human, director of the Hermitage Museum wrote. Joseph Pieper um, said, art prevents the creation from sinking into oblivion. Kurt Vonnegut said, the arts are a way of making life more bearable. Aristotle wrote, poetry elevates our consciousness so that we learn how to exercise discernment. And I read that and I think of this, and some of you, and I don't agree 100% with John Keating's philosophy of Ed and the Dead Poet Society, but he says, we do not read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry, why? Because we are members of the human race. You know, law, 
business. These are things to sustain life, but poetry, love, romance, these are things we stay alive for. Now, certainly we can find theological problems with that statement, but it takes poetry beyond the idea that it's just something we do. Or if you've ever seen the movie Contact, um, she's an agnostic, Jodie Foster, I won't go through it, and I'm sorry this is going to spoil a little bit of it, but maybe this will tease you into wanting to watch it. She gets launched into a wormhole. How she gets to that wormhole, I'm not going to tell you. But she, get, she gets launched into a wormhole. She gets launched into the outer regions of the universe. And she sees something. She's a scientist. She's an engineer. And she says, she starts to like weep. She's seeing the creation of the universe in some ways. She begins to weep. And she says, there are no words. There are no words. They should have sent, not me, a poet. I thought, wow. In a sense, why do we write this way? Because sometimes we stand in awe of a creator. Even, even the person who denies God's existence still stands in awe of a creator. What is the purpose of creating? Leonardo da Vinci said to depict the intention of man's soul. Ernest Dimnit, uh, who is a philosopher, theologian, architect, said architecture of all the arts is the one which acts the most slowly, but the most surely on the soul. Albert Einstein said it would be possible to describe everything scientifically, but it would make no sense. Like you describe a Beethoven symphony by wavelengths. Or just jazz washes away the dust of everyday life. Is art valuable? Well, you can spend some time going through the fact that, let's say, Greek antiquities are now being argued about, like the British Museum. If you want to see the greatest Greek antiquities, you go to like the British Museum. Greece wants them back. Egypt wants them back. So this is, this is political. Um, you can see it in Monuments Men, which became a famous book and certainly a, a, a famous movie. I'd recommend, if you like Monuments Men, read Rape of Europa. I think it's much better, much more detailed. Uh, they've even done a documentary on it about the value of art uh, from the perspective of World War II and certainly the uh, Nazi regime. You can see paintings like this or pictures like this. It was the greatest art theft in the history of the world. That's the Nike wing victory being wheeled out of the Louvre. They hid that from the Nazis. You can see, I mean, there, that's so, could you imagine holding a Leonardo da Vinci? This is woman with uh, ermine. But we might think, well, that's 50 years ago. Well, this is happening today. This is destruction in uh, ISIS-held areas in the Middle East. And interestingly enough, it's not just Christians who react this way. It's the world reacts this way. Even the destruction of the, the giant Buddha that was in um, Afghanistan under the Taliban. And that's one of the more recent ones. That's the destruction of the tomb. I think it's the tomb of Jonah. Uh, I was listening to an archaeologist who said that fortunately 90% or 80% hasn't been excavated yet. So they're unaware of being able to destroy what's still in the ground. I thought, wow, what, what a fascinating way to see that the ground is retaining much of our, um, of our, our history through the art. Next week, if any of you are around, Mako is going to be on campus uh, delivering a, um, an arts and culture um, kind of conference. So if any of you are familiar with the International Arts Movement one that was held year, for years in New York City. Uh, so he'll be on, on campus. If you've never heard Mako speak, he's one of those people that every word chosen, I always feel like it's like I, I pale in comparison. They're all chosen so carefully. At least they appear to be. Um, and I love hearing him just talk. Uh, but he's going to be on campus, and he's written a, uh, a couple years ago called A Letter to the North American Churches, and he wrote this, you the church unwisely neglected them. And he's talking about artists. So even what, uh, maybe even some ways our churches need to say, forgive us for rejecting art and architecture. Forgive us for thinking that buildings don't matter. Forgive us for thinking that beauty doesn't matter. He says, you gave away artistic expression to the secular culture. So the integration of art, politics, history, I want to, I want to end here uh, in about the last five or six, seven minutes here with some examples of how we can see this. Uh, last year we, we celebrated, remembered, I wouldn't call it a celebration, remembered the beginning, the 100th year anniversary, the centennial of, the, of World War I. Now I'm going to say something, this is my opinion, I don't give my opinion that often in class, but I do give my students this particular opinion, I'll give you my opinion, I'm going to put it on camera, that I think World War I is the most important event of the last uh, several hundred years. I think we have not, as a Western world, recovered from it yet. I think we have not recovered from it spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, politically, geographically, um, nationalistically. I think in many ways we focus on World War II and we forget about World War I. Um, and I want to illustrate some of those things here through the lens of art. Um, but before we get to that, Pablo Picasso said, what is an artist? He says, an imbecile who has only eyes to see if he is a painter, or ears if he is a musician, or a liar in his heart if he is a poet. Far, far from it. 
he is also a political being. And you don't have to look far in terms of um, uh, Picasso's work in terms of Guernica that changed his perception of even his own art. And that's about the destruction of the city of Guernica in the Spanish Civil War leading up to uh, World War II. You can also see it in this in June 17, 1789. This took place, the tennis court oath, the paintings by Jacques-Louis David. And he says the space, and uh, this is by Simon Shama in his book, uh, The Power of Art, he says that space it matters. Because that space is engulfing the people in the, on the floor. And he says back here, and there's a lightning bolt, you can barely see it, and a storm's blowing in. And he says the purpose that what David is trying to s explain there is that, in a sense, the power of the movement of revolution will even sweep away people, like it will sweep away regimes. That is an unstoppable force captured in a work of art. Um, you can see even here, I'm sorry the painting in the back didn't come up uh, there, but it's American Progress by John Gass where you have the, the angel kind of leading the uh, uh, explorers and the pioneers westward. And a lot of people don't realize, my students were shocked, my, my American history students didn't realize in her hand she's holding a school book. And if you know anything about Pennsylvania, Carlisle, Pennsylvania at one time had a school where Native Americans were brought, or First Americans were brought from the West to Carlisle to be westernized, to be civilized. And part of that was through school. All you got to do is go back and read Henry Dawes and the uh, explanation of the Dawes Act of the late 1800s. You can even see it uh, in here. I mean, it's kind of connection to Rudyard Kipling's Take Up the White Man's Burden. Even this, uh, this was something I had never really heard of Shinoberry before, but um, Ibi Inki Alao, Ibi Alao, who's a friend of the university, a friend of mine now, uh, he's an ambassador of art, the world ambassador for art, he's from Nigeria. He took us to the Barnes exhibit, actually he was dining in our, li in our living room, in our, our living room is very close to our kitchen, so. Uh, <laughs> but he was dining in our kitchen that morning, uh, and uh, we took him down to the Barnes exhibit, we walked in, and uh, they were like, Your Excellency, I was like, I have to call you Your Excellency? I didn't know that. You were just playing you know, Nerf guns with my son like 20 <laughs> minutes ago, 30 minutes ago. And, um, but he took us to his exhibit in the Barnes exhibit, and I, this was there. And I'd never seen this before. They're headless on purpose. Um, you can see on the map, or on, the, on the table, is the map of Africa. This is about the Berlin Conference where the Western powers came together and carved up Africa. And he says they're headless because they are unthinking brutes imperializing and suppressing an entire continent, which again, we still are paying dearly for internationally. You can see some of the artwork in here, it's on the politicalization, this is called The Death of Major Pearson by John Singleton Copley. Notice again, dying under a flag, you can't think of anything much more romantic in terms of the nationalism in there, and it echoes the uh, Tennyson's uh, Charge of the Light Brigade. I won't say as loudly as I usually say for my students. I say, you cannot read this poem. You must shout this poem. I think it captures the essence of the poem, especially if you're in like Manor Hall or something much more even acoustically sound. But when can their glory fade? Oh, while the charge they made, all the world wondered. And it says at the end, to honor the light brigade, honor the charge they made. So art matters, the Great War. The First World War, and this is one of the reasons why I do think it is so significant, the First World War killed fewer victims than the Second World War, but in many ways left even deeper scars. The old world never recovered from the shock. You can see it in terms of the artwork, and again, you're going to see some of this here, but the artist and the warrior, Theodore Rabb, says, the book examines two seemingly opposite subjects, war and art. And it's when you look at the history of art, it's really it's interesting to, to integrate this idea of how do we use beauty uh, if, if that is the goal of art, and this is one of the reasons I think World War I, going all the way back to Deschamps' to exhibit, why do we have the urinal as a work of art? What is, what is, what is Deschamps saying in 1917? Did artists foresee the World War? This is another way to think of artists. Uh, in her article, uh, Margaret Macmillan says, in the years before the Great War, artists from Stravinsky to Picasso to Proust to Dzerzhinsky, who is a, um, uh, a ballet composer, says, started rebelling against the old order. In Mahler's Sixth Symphony, um, I have a lesson plan where I use the Beethoven's Ninth, Fourth Movement, and Mahler's Sixth, Fourth Movement. And if you listen to Mahler's Sixth, it has a very similar uh, crescendo that's building up that looks like it's going to explode into an ode to joy, and it doesn't. And what happens is there's a monumental finale. I always thought if I could play uh, in, a, in an orchestra, I could play the Mahler hammer. Because what they do is they t it's a long hammer. Sometimes it's from me all the way out to the table here. And they slam it on the, on the stage. And the stage, I've seen it performed, and it shakes. And it breaks the music. And there are a lot of musicologists who have argued or thought through the idea that what he's actually describing is what's to come. In a sense, they're the canaries in the mind, are these artists. You can see it in, even in Kandinsky's. It's 1913. Not 1914, 1913. 
In Shock of the New, uh, World War I changed the life of words and images and art radically and forever. Industrialized death, this was at first indescribable. What to paint was a problem for the war artist. The old heroics were gone forever. The impressionist technique was now ineffective. And what was to come was this. This is an Otto Dix painting. You can almost smell the putrid fresh flesh through his paint. You know, that's vastly different than this. This is the death of General Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham in the French and Indian War outside the gates of Quebec. And it's hard to do that in that style. It changed art, words, forever. These are just some paintings. We'll go through these a little bit quicker here. And I'll provide this to Paul Neal if he wants to put this on the web. You can take a look at these a little bit more detail. This is a track of the Lusitania. Lusitania, which was sunk by a German torpedo in 1915. In his poem, Dolces Cajon Rest, which means uh, it is sweet and right to die for your country, he tells, in a sense, the idea that the Charger Light Brigade, don't believe the lie, it is just not sweet and right to die for your country. He talks about drunk with fatigue, uh, it deaf even to the hoots as gas gels dropping softly behind you. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, flitting your hum cleansing helmet just in time. How do you glorify a gas attack? Even in the movie Regeneration, he says, I always thought poetry is the opposite of all that, the ugliness. No future historian in the United States will be able to use quotations from her 20th century poets in support of an imperial policy of conquest and slaughter. Art is political. These are some more paintings of them, gas attacks. Even in the Hague Convention, I've had my students engage in this idea about international law. Even the idea of futurism, the idea of man melding with machine. And then, of course, we can ask the question, I'm just going to skip through this here, for what? And the painting at the very end. And I think in many ways, that question is still being asked about of World War I. You know, Todd spoke at the very beginning about this idea of cohesion, integration, pulling together. And as he was speaking on Monday or Tuesday night, I kept thinking about this poem by um, Yeats, um, The Second Coming, where he says, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. You think about the integration of that and the idea of art, art or education in the integration as opposed to about it. So Europe that died in the fields of Europe was something beyond the sum of its stricken parts. The new world of Europe that would emerge from the experience was quite different. It was darker, more violent, more polarized, more cynical, less sure of itself, and less given to confident assertions of its own superiority. Um, I'm going to stop there. I have a couple more slides before I get to the um, uh, Dadaist, the return to Dadaist. When you look at the urinal or the, the fountain uh, by Deschamps, uh, it was created or presented as art in 1917. What the Dadaists were trying to do was say, you know what, all this reasoning, all this beauty, all the, all the things that have come before us, look what it's led to. It is an anti-war movement. I don't know if any of you walked past it last night and said, that's an anti-war exhibit. And what would it take to actually engage it in that way, an integrated way? But I want to stop, so I, I, I don't want to take too much more time away from uh, Paula uh, Gosser. We're going to have to transition, right, because Paula's going to have to take the mic here. So we'll take uh, about 30 seconds, and, uh, but, but thank you. I have no signal like I would have in middle school to get your attention back, so I'll just start talking. Yeah. If any of you are middle school teachers, you know what this means, right? Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a confession up front, just because I find this makes my life easier as a speaker. I've taught for 32 years, and I still struggle when I first start to talk with stage fright. And so you're going to hear it in my voice. And it, it really doesn't matter. I get over it. But I just like to say it up front because, because it's a fact. And it helps me to tell you right now my knees are shaking, my hands are shaking. And I've taught for 32 years. And I've spoken to groups of 300 people. And it still doesn't go away. But God is gracious and he gets me through it. So Lord willing, I've been on my knees this morning. My husband has been on his knees. And hopefully uh, this will all work itself out. We're going to take a total turn. I loved Chris's presentation. I think he has made a compelling case for integrating the arts. I get to make a case 
for integrating the sciences. And in a lot of ways, this is a much harder case to make. There are easy ways to talk about this, and there are hard questions we have to ask when we talk about how do you integrate the sciences. I've been a science teacher, as I said, for 32 years. It's sort of become my job description to make students uncomfortable because I teach Christian students about science. Those of you who are nodding, you know what I'm talking about. It's not an easy task. It's not for the faint of heart. I believe it's possible. And so what I want to do today is literally present for us a framework of how I think it's possible not to answer all the questions, because I don't think that's possible, but to provide a coherent framework for students where they can find comfort in their perplexity. I hope, I hope you can go along with me. You may not be a science teacher. You may think, how are my first graders going to relate to this? This seems a little irrelevant to me, but you're a Christian and you live in a scientific world. So if something that I say here today is helpful to you personally, praise the Lord for that. So I start with this because I knew I was going after Chris and if I didn't put a piece of artwork in here, <laughs> that was not gonna go well. This is actually my favorite work of art that relates to science, The Astronomer by Vermeer. This is not good integration because it's there just so I could say, I put in a picture of art, look at that. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I need to learn from Chris. What I want us to start with is the definition of science, because we can't talk about science and biblical integration unless we're on the same page about the definition. It's a long definition. Again, these slides will be available. I want to point out a couple things. Science is the systematic enterprise of gathering knowledge about the natural universe and organizing and condensing that knowledge into testable descriptions and explanations. Please notice science studies the natural world. We'll come back to that and talk about why that component is really very important to think about. So here at the university, I teach a class called the History and Philosophy of Science. What I really think it should be taught is, let's talk about the really controversial issues for Christians. <laughs> That's really what it should be called. And in that class, I ask my students to do this. I ask them to write about this question. To what extent should our understanding of scripture influence our thinking about science? And to what extent should the findings of science influence our reading of scripture? Now, if you think about that, that's integration, but that's a tough question to answer. So I want to show you what one of my students wrote. I'm sorry it's long. I think it's worth reading. I have come to realize that the integrated life is much more challenging when it comes to science and biblical interpretation. Because many scientific theories are not addressed directly in scripture, we need to wrestle with the concept in a different way than we would wrestle with theological disequilibrium. Although it is important to consider scientific theories and biblical integration, we run into issues when we try to allow one to influence the other. Allowing biblical interpretation to influence scientific theory can quickly lead to closed-minded ignorance. Allowing science to interpret scripture leads to a sense of spiritual disequilibrium. And, and I don't know about you, but you can feel the angst in that, can't you? You can feel the struggle this student is having. How do I let these two fields of inquiry, these two ways of knowing about realities that are equally real but different, how do I integrate that? I want to be a coherent, whole, integrated person. So here's what I try to do, and I'll be really eager to hear afterwards if you think there's any merit to this. I think we change the question. I don't think the right question to ask is what does it mean to biblically integrate the sciences? I think the question is this, what does it mean to teach the sciences with biblical integrity? Because I think that focuses us on the student as a whole person. If Christian schooling is about discipleship, 
When I teach my students about how to integrate science, I want them to be different people at the end of that. And I want them to be different people because they have been taught science in a, in a way that is, um, that teaches all of the Bible as applying to them and their understandings. I think you'll see what I mean if I go a little bit further. So we're gonna start with this. This is a foundation, right? My husband, who you've met, is a builder. Uh, he builds all kinds of things. He builds motorcycles, he builds furniture, he builds houses, and he's building a garage. This happens to be in California. And I have learned from him that if the foundation is not right, the building won't be right. This foundation wasn't right. It was three quarters of an inch out of level, or I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly. He spent an enormous amount of time and energy and mental aggravation getting the foundation right. If we don't get the foundation of science education right, I don't think our students can biblically integrate it. So what do I mean by the foundation of science? Well, I'm gonna talk about two pillars. One pillar are the philosophical presuppositions of science, and the other pillar is a category, I guess you would say, called the nature of science. I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because I would like Marty to be able to speak sometime before lunch today. The presuppositions of science, now what are those? Okay, we're using big words. The idea is this, all scientists, regardless of their worldviews, implicitly agree that certain things are true. If they didn't, they wouldn't do science, and they wouldn't presume that you can study the natural world systematically. Let me show you those presuppositions without any, uh, no opinion yet. The natural real world is real and is worthy of study. Well, duh, right? <laughs> to me, philosophy, there's a lot of, well, duh, right? I think they just say things we already know. Sorry, philosophers, okay? <laughs> the natural world is real and worthy of study. And, we, and scientists have to agree that that's true. Natural phenomena are repeatable. They are regular across space and time. If I drop this in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, it falls to the ground just like it does in Eureka, California. Natural law, the natural order is predictable across space and time. Natural causes exist for natural effects. Scientists look for natural explanations of what we see in the natural world, right? And that irritates us as Christians because we would like them to be acknowledging God. But there has to be some understanding that there are natural causes for natural effects. If, if acorns fall out of the tree and dent the hood of my brand new car, none of us look for tree sprites, right? We're not animists. We think, oh, something you know, broke loose up there and it fell due to gravity. And scientists all agree that humans can accurately, somewhat accurately, perceive and understand the natural world, right? I don't care if you take a, Christ, uh, sorry, a scientist who is a Christian, an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, it doesn't matter. They will agree to all of these. The point I make with my students, and this is, I think, where we start to biblically integrate, is this. You can't explain why these things should be true apart from a biblical worldview. You can try, but a biblical worldview gives the most complete explanation and foundation for those assumptions of any worldview and any philosophy. So I'll just do one, again, for the sake of time. I'll throw both of these up here so you can kind of look. I have my students write this as a paper. Take all the presuppositions of science, and you create a biblical uh, apologetic for those foundational assumptions. So let's just take the first one. The natural world is real and worthy of study. Psalm 19.1 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse shows his handiwork. So when we study the natural world, it is worthy of study because we're studying the God who created it. God tells Adam to name the animals. He has, in those days, right back in that culture, to name something gave it meaning. You had to understand it to name it. We're told to be stewards of creation. You can't steward what you don't know. So there are biblical reasons for 
this presupposition being true. I could go through all the presuppositions of science and do this for you. Okay? And as students do this, they're laying a biblical foundation for the practice of science, which is where it should be. The nature of science. You know, if we're going to use sort of the creation, fall, redemption model, the nature of science is really where we start to see the fall come in. Uh, the nature of science, let me, let me put it this way. Think of somebody close to you, your spouse, your best friend, your children. And if I said to you, what is their nature? Well, you would think about things like their characteristics, right? Their personality, what they're good at. The nature of science is exactly that. The nature of science is, what does it do? What is it good at? It is empirical. That means it's based on observations that we could all make, repeat, and agree on. It's logical. You draw logical conclusions. It's about the natural world. Anyone ever says, science has proven there is no God. Right there, just with what you know now, you can stop them and say, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Science only claims to describe the natural world. That might be a scientist making a worldview claim, but that's not what science can say. Science is done by humans. I think we do kids a disservice when we teach them science as a body of facts to be memorized that are objective and true. Because science changes. Science is tentative in its conclusions, and I think that's one of its strengths. As we learn more about the natural world through data, we actually change our conclusions to some extent. But here's where all that fall comes in. We are fallible, fallen human beings. And so we use the process of peer review to try to come to some conclusions that we feel are solid. How many of you flew here in a plane today? How many of you have taken some medicine within the last week? Right? I mean, let's be honest. We use the conclusions of science when it, you know, doesn't upset us. So those are the foundations, okay? We've laid the foundation. We've laid, I think, a biblical foundation. So then you do the framing, right? The framing comes next. Hang with me here. We've got four chairs here. I'm going to build a framework for you. Okay. Uh, I think this is a helpful framework. Nobody's going to have to sit here, so don't get nervous that you're going to have to come up front and do anything. The framework that I want to present to you, actually, I, I took the categories from a, a man named John Mays. He writes Christian uh, textbooks for classical schools, uh, science textbooks for Christian classical schools. And he wrote this article called Making Elbow Room for Faith. And basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that there are four kinds of questions that science asks. And I'm going to use this as a framework to help us talk about how do we help our students integrate science. Maybe how do we help us integrate science. Okay? So, get my little, here's where the whole school of ed, you know, acting dean things come in. I have to kind of use uh, visuals for you. Let's look at these questions. What causes the prevailing wind patterns? What is the molecular structure of a diamond? What causes the Earth's magnetic poles to change directions? We're going to call those room one questions. Okay? And those are questions that science can answer. We have no need of resorting to uh, a, a God explanation, although as believers we certainly say Glory to God when we uncover the beauty and the design in his creation. Absolutely. But these are questions that science is confident it can answer. You're confident it can answer them. And we don't call them controversial questions at all. In the next room, you have questions like this. What causes Alzheimer's disease? How are quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity related? How do we cure cancer? These are questions that scientists say we will find an answer to. We haven't yet, but based on the history of science, based on 
what we already know about the natural world, we're fairly confident that we will answer those questions. The third room. Here's where it gets fun. How did life originate? Where did human self-consciousness or humor or compassion, put anything in there that you want, where did it come from? How did meaningful information find its way into DNA? Why is there information there at all? This is where we are going to start to differ with scientists. Naturalistic scientists will say we can answer these questions with nothing but science. As believers, we're going to say, I don't think so. My spiritual intuition, if that's an okay thing to refer to it as, says, and this is my personal opinion, as Chris said, I don't think that there are complete naturalistic answers to these questions. I just don't. And then we get to the fourth room. What caused the Big Bang? I mean, let's just, let's grant the Big Bang as a satisfactory description of where all the matter of the universe came from. Let's just, let's give them that. What started it? And, and where'd the singularity come from in the first place, right? Why are there natural laws governing the, governing the universe at all? Why is the universe orderly? So that's going to go in a room that we call cannot. Scientists even admit they can't answer those questions. Uh, Stephen Hawking, just last week, uh, I thought for a while maybe he was going to become a Christian. My husband and I just watched a really interesting video on his life. And he was talking a lot back in his book, A Brief History of Time, about why are there natural laws? Why is there a universe for the laws to describe? And I thought, yes. And just last week, did you see it in the news? He, he avowed, I am an atheist. Human intellect can learn everything there is to know about reality. And it was such a sad moment for me, because we had just talked about, wow, you know, maybe he's a Christian. Now, there's our rooms. There's our framework. I haven't said anything particularly upsetting yet. Maybe I have, but, but you all still look very pleasant. You haven't thrown anything at me. So I'm going to ask you a question. Ready? And I promise you're not going to have to say anything. Just think it in your head. Which room does that question go in? How old is the Earth? Is that a room? One, two, three, or four question in your own mental space. How about this one? Is the Earth's climate changing? Room one, two, three, or four. Oh, you're all, I'm getting the greatest looks back from you guys here. This is fun. How did the diversity of living things arise? Is there an evolutionary explanation for that? I call these questions the ugly lamp questions. Okay? This, this lamp, it is a, a, a steer femur, actually a beef femur, won first place in a design contest for the world's ugliest lamp. There you have it. So I brought a lamp. I don't know if you think this is ugly. I, I didn't when I bought it. Now I'm sort of like, eh, I don't know. Don't, don't love it. Let's just take that age of the earth question. Okay. Scientists put the age of the earth question right here, okay, in the can category. Science can adequately explain that question. 4.6 billion years old, that's a can question. It's not a controversy, there's, there's no debate to teach. That's what scientists think. But as believers, you know that if I asked all of us in this room, some of us would put it here. It's a settled issue. It's a scientific question that for us is a settled issue. Some of us might hide the lamp maybe behind the sofa, <laughs> right? Like, well, it's settled, but I'm not putting that lamp out there for everybody to see. Okay. Some of us put the lamp in the, the will category, right? We put our ugly lamp here. Well, I don't know. Science hasn't convinced me yet. There are an awful lot of assumptions in that radiometric dating stuff, and I'm just not sure yet. Some of us put the lamp here. 
right? Whoops. So let's try to put the lamp here. This is a worldview-related question. It has everything to do with how I read Genesis 1, and it should. I understand that completely. And if I give in on this question, then my understanding of all of Scripture, because Genesis is foundational, is somehow going to become flawed or distorted or misguided. And so I think this lamp goes here. You can see the problem we have then when we try to teach students about science. Because we are conflating two things. And I don't think it's an inappropriate conflation. It's, it's a natural one. There is the science of the ugly lamp, right? How, how, why do scientists think the Earth is 4.6 billion years old? But then there's the worldview. There's the interior decorating question of the lamp. What room does it go in as believers? That's why biblical integration for Christian teachers, I think, is the hardest kind of integration that there is. Because we, are all, we might all agree on what the science says, but we don't all agree on the relative importance of bringing scripture to bear on what the science says. This is actually has been for me a helpful model for my students. And you might say, well, why? Why is that helpful? What does it do? I'll just throw these up here very quickly for the sake of time so that we have some time for discussion. It shows, Christians, or, sorry, it shows students that Christians have a range of opinions. Okay? That just how they think isn't necessarily how all Christians think. It temporarily gets rid of the angst and the emotion associated with trying to teach a scientific topic honestly and truthfully. It gives these worldview questions their proper, rightful role in the science classroom. And it gives our students a framework for handling disequilibrium. You know, if, if I'm a student and I can say, oh, this is, a, this is an ugly lamp issue, I get why I'm wrestling with this, they have a little bit more of a sense of comfort. And, and why is that important? Dr. Williams is very fond of using this uh, from Alice in Wonderland, right, about the rabbit hole. And he says, when we try to talk about difficult issues, it's okay to lead students to the rabbit hole, but it's not okay to leave them there. And so here are the kinds of questions that everything I just said brings up for students, and it probably did in your mind as well. Well, then, is there absolute truth, really, Paula? If it's okay that we just, we're going to put the lamp wherever we think it goes, then is there absolute truth in life, in Scripture? If we're all Christians, this is the 1960s question, why don't we just all get along and love each other? And this one I think they wrestle with the most. If I have ambiguity about these questions, am I really a Christian? Do I really have faith? Is that really okay? Here's where we're gonna finish the house. And this comes back to, I think now, how we talk to students about their perplexity and their disequilibrium and how we help them through that makes them into different kinds of people and we need to make sure that they're thinking about this biblically. So I'm going to close with this, the last few things here. I would say acknowledge ambiguity. Uh, I think we do our students a disservice, and again my opinion, when we make these sorts of ugly lamp questions dichotomies where we have the right answer and everybody else is wrong. Teach them that ambu ambiguity does not mean that, that there is no absolute truth. There is absolutely absolute truth. It is in our fallen humanness that the difficulty of finding it arises. I teach my students to be humble and to be gracious. The world is watching us. And the world watches how we talk about things as much as what we say. And if our students aren't humble and gracious in these areas, I, I really think I worry about what that does to their testimony to a watching world. Please, I'm a science teacher, please teach science as truthfully as you know how. And that's not to besmirch anybody and say we're intentionally running around teaching falsehoods. But it's easy to avoid hard questions. It's easy to create false dichotomies. It's easy to present information that, frankly, is not quite accurate. 
please encourage your students to think for themselves. I don't know what, what ages you teach, but I never, ever, ever, ever tell my students what I think about any of the ugly lamp questions in class until the very last day of class. And they know from the first day of the semester. Last day of class, I'll tell you anything you want to know. You can ask me anything at all. Absent or no absentees that day ever. It's great, right? Full class. <laughs> because I want them to think for themselves. I really, and, and I genuinely mean this, and it's taken me a while to get here. I don't care where the lamp goes. I don't. In my students' lives, I don't care. But I care that they put it there thoughtfully and, and with an articulate explanation for why it's in the room it's in. And they understand why other people might put it in a different room. Last, present science from a kingdom perspective. This is the joy of teaching science. And this is where biblical integration is easy. You know, the creation shows us about God. It, it reveals to us his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. This resonates with, with college students, the apologetic aspect of this. The world looks at us. Scripture tells us that how we love one another is an indicator of our faith to a watching world. If we are sniping at each other as believers about where does the lamp go, we harm our testimony as a church and if they can't art articulate where the lamp goes as students, they harm their testimony personally to the world. So there's the garage. I know you're dying to know, right? Is it done? No. And I purposely put a picture here of it not done because I, I want to drive home again. I think this is a lifelong process. I think, praise God, if you have arrived at a place where you feel like You've kind of got this all figured out. I don't. I don't. I want to read you just, I want to end with a student paper again. Here's what a student said, and this is one of their last writings. I do not believe that we will ever fully understand science. I am not certain that we will ever know for sure which way is the correct way to interpret scripture. And I am absolutely positive that we will never fully understand the character of God. Sometimes that ambiguity haunts us. It practically drives us mad. But the mystery of it all can be something beautiful and useful as well. I believe that what we need to do is realize that nature and scripture were both authored by God, and therefore the two must coincide in some way. And to that, I think we can all say amen. Thank you.